hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, the Lord is good, isn't he? And his mercy endures forever. Ooh, already a sweet presence. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and thank you for the time and uh, you invest in your talents. Praise God. We love you, man. You guys love Jesus coming out on Saturday night. Glory. And you guys do. You drove a long way to get here. <laughs> We're going to have a great time uh, over the next uh, three services. I so appreciate your pastors having us. Uh, thank you so much. You know, we've been here several times through the years, and we were able to be a part of a, a transition several years back. And, of course, uh, friends with Pastor Cody here and his family. And so many of you, if I haven't had a chance to, you know, greet you or shake your hand, please come speak to me. And I'm not one of these guys that have to hide in the back to protect the anointing. Oh, you know, so I don't mind hugging you and giving you a handshake and introducing myself. Uh, so I uh, would love to do that. Anyway, uh, you know, like I said, these three services, you know, Jesus told Brother Hagen. Uh, how many of you are commit, uh, familiar with Kenneth E. Hagen? Raise your hand. Probably most of you. <clears throat> One of the visions uh, that he had, uh, and I may talk about several, but he said, you know, every time the saints come together, I have a purpose for their gathering. Amen. And if men will take time to seek me and to hear from me and, and to follow the purpose I set forth, you'll have the, the best result in the service. So my, my job isn't to decide what I'm going to do, but to discern it and then flow with it, right? So that's what we're going to do tonight. Every service will be different. Tonight, I, I, if I had to say, uh, it would be more motivational for us as the body of Christ. Uh, uh, for this time and season, uh, tomorrow morning will be a word of encouragement as we navigate some events that will be unfolding in the future uh, in the world. And then uh, Sunday evening will be a time of refreshing. So you come on back and get your cup full. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But we're going to get full tonight, too. The word's always good. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, you know the scripture. The Bible says to everything there is a season. And a time for every purpose under heaven. One translation says, everything has its appointed hour. How many of you know that Jesus is coming soon? Uh, this is a very important season for you and I as members of the body of Christ. As we await uh, his return, God is counting on us. As the body of Christ and members in particular uh, to manifest the fullness of his person, his presence, his glory and his goodness to the world in which uh, we live. John G. Lake, uh, who was born in 1870, he was uh, an apostle to the continent of Africa. Tremendous signs, wonders and miracles and also, of course, here in the United States, mightily used of God as well. Uh, but he made this statement he said, in my estimation, the greatest revelation that a believer uh, can receive and the greatest experience he can receive are these. He said, first of all, the revelation would be Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The realization that not only is Jesus seated at the right hand of God on high, but through the person of the Holy Spirit, he has actually taken up residence in your heart and mind with the expectation of revealing himself in all of his goodness and power and mercy and compassion and salvation to the world in which we live. He said second to that or subsequent to that revelation is the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit enabling you and I and empowering you and I to live in and to live out that revelation. Amen. So thinking of that in Colossians uh, 2 verses 9 and 10, I want you to notice the Bible says in him or in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. One translation says, in Christ, God gives a full and complete expression of himself. 
And you, by your union with Christ, are also a full and complete expression of God. Are you with me? So Jesus Christ was everything that God wanted to say to man. And God desires that you and I personally and certainly corporately or collectively exemplify His fullness and particularly now as this dispensation is culminating. Now notice in Ephesians uh, 4 and 7, speaking about this uh, fullness of God, Paul said to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the King James says, each one of us have received a measure of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so that means if I had a container up here of flour and I begin to dip out with a measuring spoon and I dip one measure, 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 and all of these measures are on the, on the podium. Well, if I were to take each of those measures and put them back in the container, we once again have the fullness of the whole that I began with. And so you and I are collectively the body of Christ, but God has invested in each member a special gift, endowment, or charge according to the gift of Christ, the Scripture says. And so Paul goes on to tell us in Ephesians 4 and 16, notice, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working uh, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I'm an old King James guy. I'm trying to graduate to the new King James. But, but you know, the old King James says, according to the effectual working within the measure of each part makes increase of the body. Are you with me? So in order for you and I to, to manifest the fullness of God in this hour as this dispensation is culminating, it is imperative that every measure be operating at full capacity, that there be a strong operation, if you will, an effectual working within uh, the measure of each part. And so in order for our measures to be operating at full capacity, Quite naturally, uh, it's imperative, first of all, that we're born of the Spirit. We understand that. But equally important is that we are filled with the Spirit. We are empowered by the Spirit. And we are led by the Spirit. Are you with me? And so, you know, as we look at the New Testament, and particularly in the book of Acts, we can see that it was men and women who, if we want to use this terminology, were successfully or powerfully used by God in impacting uh, their sphere of influence. Uh, they were men and women who the Bible specifically uh, describes as those who are, were filled with the Spirit. Now, not just initially baptized with the Spirit, we understand that's important, but those who were maintaining a Spirit-filled life and subsequently being empowered and directed by that same Spirit. Let's look at a couple of examples and I know this evening you're well taught, you're well versed in Scripture. I'm not sharing things you don't know, but it seemed to me and, and uh, by the Spirit that we should just once again uh, remind ourselves of these things so that we're motivated in the right direction. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Now you'll remember Peter and John had been up at the gate called Beautiful and they had healed uh, that crippled man who was crippled from his mother's womb and never had walked. Oh, Glory! And so they, they'd healed, uh, brought that manifestation of healing to the gentleman, and then it caused quite a stir. So they're called before the Sanhedrin, and, and this is the testimony of the Scripture, uh, beginning in verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, uh, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, I'm sure that went over well, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. 
So it says he was filled with the Spirit. Now watch verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness, that's courage and fearlessness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. You don't have to be well educated and trained to be mightily used of God. They marveled and they realized that they'd been with Jesus. So, of course, now, after they stand before the Sanhedrin, they're released to their own company, and they go out and they have a prayer meeting. And notice in verse 34, and when they'd prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Woo! How you like that? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So quite naturally, one of the byproducts of being filled with the Spirit is boldness, fearlessness, courage. Are you with me? Uh, here's another example, Acts chapter 6. Uh, the context, of course, is uh, the apostles in Jerusalem were attempting to find some individuals who could help them in administrative duties, uh, waiting on tables and ministering to the needs of widows. And uh, so this is the context of this scripture. Uh, 6, beginning in verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually uh, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, notice, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip, and they mentioned some other individuals. Now notice uh, verse 8, Acts 6 and verse 8. Here's the man they chose who was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So obviously when one is filled with faith and filled with the Spirit, there are going to be signs, wonders, and miracles in their midst. Are you with me? Here's another example. Acts 11 and 24. Acts 11 and 24. Speaking of Barnabas, who was one of Paul's companions on his uh, missionary journey. Uh, notice what the scripture testifies. He was a good man. Well, that's great. But watch. Full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And great many people were added to the Lord. So once again, man, when you and I are filled with the Spirit, then it's going to impact the harvest around us. And here's one uh, final example, just to substantiate our point. Acts 13, uh, beginning in verse 9 through 11, you'll remember that uh, Paul's ministry was being hindered by a sorcerer named Elymas. And this is what the scripture says, verse 9, Saul, who's also called Paul. This is Acts 13, uh, verses 9 to 11, and they've got it here for you. Uh, Saul, who also co called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Man, we got some people like that on the news. I'd like to say that too. <laughs> Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. How many of you know that kind of divine authority will get some attention? And he was operating in that because he was Filled with the Spirit. And of course, he didn't execute it on his own authority. Obviously, there was an unction to do so, right? So, being filled with the Spirit enables us to operate in that authority more proficiently. So the point uh, this evening is, if being filled and staying filled with the Spirit uh, brings all of these byproducts, then it is quite uh, naturally... Uh, imperative that you and I follow their example and we stay filled with the Spirit. Now, 1987, uh, Brother Hagen had a visitation of the Lord Jesus Christ just prior to our annual camp meeting in July. 
And uh, this, this vision was multifaceted. It, it was uh, uh, recounted in a book called Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. Anybody ever seen that book? If you've never read it, you might find it very interesting. But one of the things that Jesus told him, he said, tell my people I need them to stay filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to elaborate in a moment uh, why. But I need my people uh, to stay filled with the Spirit. And so where was I? I don't know. But anyway, I need my people filled with the Spirit. So God is depending on us as we culminate this dispensation uh, to be a body of Christ individually and corporately corporately that is exemplifying the fullness of God, his glory, his compassion, his mercy, his love, his salvation, right? And if we're going to do it, we've got to stay filled with the spirit. And so we cannot accomplish this mandate in the arm of the flesh. It must be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that power is to be manifested through the body of Christ as a whole, not just the five-fold ministry. And I think this has been something that, that maybe we haven't emphasized enough, that we as believers, we come to church, we receive the word, and we should, and we're encouraged, and we're set on fire, and we should. This is our gathering place. This is where we are encouraged. This is where we are filled with the word and with the spirit and experience the presence of God and the anointing. And then it is from this place that we go out. And that is where the, the kingdom is advanced. Advanced. Amen. And so it's about the sons and the daughters, really. Not just the fivefold ministry exclusively. So we know this because in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, uh, beginning there. Now I'll try to do the New King James, but I, I don't know. Anyway, it says, it, it, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. We should be expecting these things. Now you say, well, uh, if I don't want to be considered old and I have a dream, just say it was a night vision, right? So your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And upon my servants and upon my maidservants or my handmaidens, I will pour out of my spirit and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath. Who's going to be prophesying and who's going to be showing as a result? The sons and the daughters, the servants and the handmaidens. Woo! Verse 20. And it will come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. So this is our season. As the body of Christ, it's always been our season. But friends, things are culminating. Jesus is coming. Amen. And we got to finish this thing strong. So we've got to be men and women who are Born of the Spirit, yes, but empowered by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, impacting this world for Christ. So this is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now back to that, uh, that visitation of 1987, I said, Jesus said, tell my people I need them to stay filled with the Spirit. He went on to say, because of this reason. He said, there are things that I have desired. Now, Jesus Christ, the head of the church, there are things that I have desired to do in the earth and through the church that I've been unable to do because of a lack of cooperation. Are you kidding me? 
Jesus, the head of the church, said there are things he wants to do in the earth and through the church that he's been unable to do because of a lack of cooperation. Friends, doesn't that make perfect sense even in the natural? Don't we understand that the purposes of the head are always contingent upon the cooperation of the body? It doesn't matter how much this head, this physical head, wants to walk over to Pastor Lathan. If this body doesn't carry the head, the head's not going anywhere. And the same reality holds true in the realm of the spirit. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 that Christ is the head. We are the body, right? And once again, the purposes of the head, even in that spirit realm, are contingent upon the cooperation of the body. And if that is true, which it is, then a further reality exists. And that reality is, I cannot and you cannot participate in things that we do not perceive. Are you with me? If the purposes of the head are contingent upon the body, that's a good reality. But the reality is, I cannot and you cannot participate in things that we do not perceive. And we cannot perceive the leadings of the Spirit unless we're walking and living in the Spirit. Are you with me? Now, when I talk about walking and living in the Spirit, I'm not talking about walking around in some kind of trance or state of euphoria being weird and goofy. I'm talking about a place that we occupy in God through the communion of the Holy Spirit where we see things and we know things and we perceive things that we would not see or know or perceive otherwise. You know the, the scripture where John speaks in Revelation 1 and 10? Uh, the very first thing he says was, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Friends, that's a place. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then he begins to articulate things that he heard and things that he saw. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing of 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, notice what he said. Uh, he said, I have not seen, nor ears heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him, but he's revealed them unto us. How? By his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And man, that whole passage, I could just keep going, it's so rich. But we'll stop there because the point is, I has not seen. There are things, friends, that God has for you and I to do uh, and to operate in that natural eyes will never see. Natural ears will never hear. The reasoning and contemplations of, uh, of the heart and mind will never perceive. They must be revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, once again, we can't participate in things that we don't uh, perceive. I want you to watch this terminology in Acts 14, 8 through 10. Uh, of course, Paul is preaching in Lystra. And he said, there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak. Now watch Paul. Who steadfastly, as the King James, steadfastly beholding him. That means he's looking intently at him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said, stand upright on your feet. And he walked and leaped and began to praise God. But notice, steadfastly beholding him. I mean, you've been in those situations. You're looking at a person, but there's a conversation going on on the inside with you and the Holy Ghost. There's a perception taking place. There's an, an insight, a knowing. Are you with me? And that is what, what was functioning here, steadfastly beholding him and perceiving something. Notice the perception preceded the action. And I think most often, particularly in dealing with other people uh, in the miraculous and, miraculous and ministering to them, 
is, is that most often, uh, you know, the most effective faith in that arena is that which is inspired by and initiated by the Holy Spirit. Really, this is the way. Uh, now, we can always lay hands on the sick. You understand that. But we're talking about manifestations uh, of the Spirit in particular uh, with the working of miracles there. But uh, Jesus operated his life and ministry this way by his own testimony. We think, oh, Jesus just did whatever. No. John 5 and 19. <laughs> Look at it. Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. What he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. He says, I don't even speak my own words as I hear. That's what I speak. So basically, Jesus, in his earthly life and ministry, said, hey, I'm living my life and I'm executing my ministry in direct response to the Father's leading and promptings through the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he was highly effective in impacting people's lives. So I said all of this tonight. Uh, this is how God wants us to live our lives as believers. And particularly now walking and living in the Spirit. Living in direct response to the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, guidance. Taking what I call our divine cues. Our divine cues. Uh, in September, uh, September the 2nd, 1950. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, I wasn't born yet. But in 1950, September 2nd, Brother Hagen uh, gives us account. He was in uh, Rockwall, Texas, uh, holding a tent meeting. He said it rained all day, so very few people came out, about 40 folks. You know, amazing things can happen in small groups of people when they get in the Spirit. So he said, I gave a short Bible lesson. And I asked the people to come down to pray. And he said, I was just kneeling on the platform, uh, praying in the Spirit uh, at a, a, one of those folding chairs. And he said, I never expected to happen what did happen, and I expected to be a man on the moon. Wasn't asking for it, seeking it. But I heard a voice say, come up here. And he said, I thought it was the kids out here on the back hill playing around. And he said, I just kept praying, and I heard the voice again, come up here. And he said, I opened my eyes, and when I did, there was Jesus standing where the top of the tent pole should be. And he said, in a moment of time, not literally, but because he was in the Spirit, uh, all the natural things disappeared from his view, the people, the, the, the chairs, the pulpit, everything. And he said, I was standing before Jesus. And he said, the first thing that happened was he was holding the most beautiful crown I have ever seen in my life. He said, the jewels in that crown are indescribable. And he said, I said to him, Lord, uh, what is that crown? And he said, Jesus said to me, this is the soul winner's crown. He said, but I say to my people, go here, speak to this one, minister to that one. And he said, they're busy, preoccupied insensitive, distracted, and miss what we would term their divine cues. And he said, as a result, uh, people go unministered to. Souls are lost. And so, you know, as I've said to you, I think we can all conclude that we're in the last days, and I might as well say the last hour. I'm telling you, all the signs in society, nature, the world, Israel, the alignment prophetically of the nations, things are accelerating so quickly, and we've got a mandate. What we do, we've got to do powerfully, we've got to do quickly, and we've got to do accurately. And once again, it cannot be done in the arm of the flesh. So we've got to be, I say ordinary people doing extraordinary things, but we're really not ordinary. We're new creations in Christ. Amen. But God's counting on us. And what I want you to take away from the service tonight is uh, I want you to see God wants to use you. He wants to use me. Really? Yes. 
in your sphere of life and, insure, uh, and influence. And I want you to begin to expect the supernatural. You know, my sister is not a Bible school graduate. She doesn't know an arsenal of Bible verses. But uh, she loves the Lord. She prays in the Spirit. Fellowships with God. If she's vacuuming, just staying in the Spirit. And she has the most incredible experiences. And they're for all of us. She said, Bubba, that's what she calls me. I'm from the South. Bubba, I was going down to the bank to make a deposit. Now, this was a while back because now you can do it with your phone, but uh, she doesn't use that. I don't know why, but anyway, going down to the bank to make a deposit, I was going through the drive through not planning to go in anywhere, no makeup. And so uh, she said, as I'm driving down the road that I always drive down to the bank, I pass an antique store. It's on the left. And she said, you know, as I, as I went by, I had this sense. Now, see, that's the leadings of the Spirit. It's not always a sentence or a vision or a voice. Most often, it is a sense. It is a, a, a perception or a knowing, as we say. She said, I had a sense that I should go into that antique store. But she said, I didn't have any makeup on, so I kept driving. But she said, the further I went, the more grieved I became. And I knew God was dealing with me. So I turned around, parked the car, went into the antique store. I have no idea why I'm there. So I'm looking at antiques. <laughs> and she said, all of a sudden, I, I saw a lady and a gentleman over uh, in the distance there talking to one another. And she said, when I saw uh, that lady, Marty, I knew that's my divine target. Now, my sister, as we looked, is bold as a lion. She could care less what anybody thinks. Now, not rude, but bold. But when you're filled with the Spirit and you know things by the Spirit, you are bold. Are you with me? So she knew. She said, that's my divine target. So she went over. She said, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt your conversation. But she said, uh, ma'am... I'm here on assignment from Almighty God. She said, I didn't even know what the assignment was. But you see, you take a step, he'll back you up. Right? So she's following the leader. I'm here on assignment from Almighty God. She said when she spoke those words, that lady began to weep right there in that store. And she started telling her story. And she said, you know, I've been backslidden for a while. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but my neighbors took me to Sunday school. And I remember singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And they prayed with me that I would be saved. And I was saved, she said. But through the years, I, I've backslidden. I've lost contact, you know. <clears throat> I don't have a church. I don't have a pastor. And she said, but I'll be honest with you, the most pressing thing at the moment is I've been diagnosed with cancer seven places in my body. And I've been calling out to God to please heal me and save me because I, I, I don't want to die. And my sister said, well, honey, that's why I'm here. And so, you know, she shared with her a few scriptures. Like I said, not an arsenal. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. And she said, the Lord loves you and he forgives you. And more than that, the Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all my iniquities and heals all my diseases. So she said, can I pray for you? My sister said, she said, well, yeah. So she laid hands on her right there in the antique store. Not a bunch of commotion, just a prayer because it's in the power of his name. And she laid hands on the lady and she said, I heard myself say, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of fear and death to come out of you and you be healed in Jesus' name. Well, the lady's crying, you know, and the guys are all eyes. He ain't saying a word, you know. <laughs> My sister gave her a big old hug. Assignment completed by one of the handmaidens going to exit the store. The lady said, hey, can I get your number uh, on my, my cell phone here and take your picture so I'll remember? She said, well, sure. So she did that. Well, you know the story? 
I don't know how long, maybe a month or so later, my sister got a cold call from that lady. She said, ma'am, do you remember me? My sister said, of course I do. Told her, you know, the antique store. She said, I got to tell you something. She said, I got to feeling so much better. I went back to the hospital and the doctors and I said, would you please run tests? Because they said there was nothing they could do to help her uh, uh, from that point. And they said, no, there's no need, honey. uh, We're sorry. There's nothing. She said, no, something's happened, please. So they did. And they came back completely negative, all the tests. She was completely healed. And it wasn't in a church service. It was in an antique store. Through a handmaid of the Lord who took her divine cue. Anybody with me? <laughs> you think God wants to use you like that? Absolutely. I had this Jehovah's Witness come to the door. Now John said, don't invite them into your house. If they come with a different gospel. So I stepped out on the stoop. To talk with them. And you had the trainer and the trainee. All right. And uh, so, uh, you know, you got the little guy trying to, you know, he's trying to find the scriptures. He's new, so I'm trying to help him find his scripture. (laughs) Giving his little spiel, you know. Well, during the course of his conversation, I noticed he kept holding the side of his face. And he was grimacing in pain, obviously. So, you know, uh, finally I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, man, I'm so sorry. He said, I, I, I woke up this morning. I've got so much pain. I don't know if it's an abscess tooth or what it is. Well, all of a sudden, man, I got a cue boing, on the inside. And I said, hey, can I make you a deal? He said, well, I guess so. Uh, now, the trainer wasn't too excited, but he was. So I said, now, I've listened to you kindly and, and with courtesy, but I'm a born-again Christian. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through him. Now, uh, would you mind if I expound to you quickly? You know, I said uh, the, what I believe to be the way of salvation. So I took him basically through the Roman road, as they call it. So I did very quickly. And I said, now let me pray for you. And I said, uh, when I pray for you, if what I shared with you is true, that saying Jesus will heal you instantly. Now, see, I'm not out on the limb because I took my cue. <laughs> I didn't initiate it. Not to saying I couldn't, just in faith. But I said, so I laid my hands right, sorry, my hands are a little cold, right there on, on the porch. And I didn't go, whoa! <laughs> now, I can do that in church and I enjoy it. You'll see that before these services are over. I know how to get happy, run some pews. Amen. But that's not the time and place. <laughs> Scare the daylights out of them. <laughs> so I just prayed a simple prayer. I said, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name whereby men must be saved. I wanted to get it all in. I command you to be healed. God is my eternal witness. I took my hand away. His eyes got big as saucers. That pain instantly left him. He was healed. And and he said, oh, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And the trainer grabbed him and ran off the porch. And I'm going down the sidewalk. Hey, wait a minute, man. we got to close the deal. Amen. (laughs) But let me tell you something. Jesus made an impact on both of them. God wants to use us. i got to go because you guys listen so well. But, uh, man, I took a drunk guy's hand one night. He's drunk. You know, drunk as a skunk. And I said, listen, God doesn't want you to live this way. He said, I know it. Now, most, a lot of those people, they were raised sometimes in church. They just backslid and got on drugs or alcohol. They love Jesus. They're just out of it. And I said, Jesus loves you. I know it. (laughs) And so I said, I said, I want to pray for you. He said, okay. So I took his hand. And when I took his hand, God's my witness. The anointing went into him and instantly evaporated all of that alcohol out of his system. (laughs) And he cussed. He said the D word. He said, D, I'm sober. (laughs) And I said, I know you are because God wants you to pay attention to the prayer I'm about to pray. So we prayed for him, gave him a big old hug, gave him some money. That's our job. We're representatives of the kingdom. And God wants to use us, all right? So what are we saying, man? You guys listen so well. If we're going to perceive the leadings of the Spirit, 
then we've got to stay filled with the Spirit. Are you with me? And if we're going to stay filled with the Spirit, then quite naturally we're going to have to incorporate into our lives certain spiritual exercises that nurture a life in the Spirit. Ephesians 5 and 18, you know it. Paul said, don't be drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That be filled in the Greek is a verb of continuance. So this is something that we are to continually do. So I said we can incorporate certain, you know, spiritual exercises. And I want to submit one to you. It's not the only one, but one that I'll submit to you that will help us stay filled with the Spirit. And you know it, and it's probably been, uh, you know, recited numerous times. But, hey, it's not what we hear or know. It's what we're doing. And God has a way of reminding us over and over if we're forgetting, Right? And that is to pray more earnestly and consistently in the Spirit. Now, you say praying in the Spirit, what's that? Well, I know you know, but I'll say it anyway. We let the Bible interpret the Bible. So what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2? He who speaks in an unknown tongue, or tongue as the New King James says, uh, does not speak to men, but to God. How be it, because no one understands, how be it or however, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So Paul is equating praying in the Spirit with praying in this supernatural language called unknown tongues. He gives us some further insight, 1 Corinthians 14. <laughs> now I know you know there's a difference in 1 Corinthians 12, which is the gift of tongues, for the purpose of interpretation in a public assembly for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the body. That's different. This is a specific word if I pray in an unknown tongue. So for, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, if I pray, well, prayers for every Christian. Are you with me? If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Aren't you glad you're a spirit being and you live in a physiological body and you're actually from a whole different dimension? Woo! If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's the conclusion? Paul said, I'll pray with the spirit. I'll pray with the understanding also. I'm going to sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding also. Paul said, I'm going to make sure I'm exercising myself in both dimensions when it comes to prayer. The natural and the supernatural. I'm going to pray in the Spirit, man. I'm going to pray with my intellect and understanding as well. So both, both arenas are edified. So Paul, contrary to some opinions, was a very strong advocate of praying in the Spirit. How do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 and 19, I thank my God, he said. I, I speak in tongues more than you all. Good gracious. You kidding me, man? More than all the Corinthian church? Yeah. But now he goes on and says, yet in the church now, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So he's simply saying, listen, guys, I pray in the Spirit excessively, but it's not in the doors of the church, right? Well, if it wasn't in the doors of the church, now we can pray as believers together in unity. But if it wasn't in the doors of the church, where was it? It was in his private, personal, devotional life. Wonder if it was uh, impactful. Well, I guess so. He had signs, wonders, miracles, wrote half the New Testament by revelation. <laughs> Are you with me? Oh, could there be any connection? Absolutely. So now you and I all realize the initial evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit as stated in the scripture and illustrated in the book of Acts is speaking in an unknown tongue. But what we want to remember is that speaking in tongues is not just the initial evidence 
of being filled with the Spirit. But it is also to be a source of continual infilling throughout our journey. Uh, uh, what was that guy's name? Howard Carter. Uh, he was the first, uh, he was the founder of the first Pentecostal Bible College in Great Britain. And he made this statement. He said, speaking in tongues is not just to be the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit, but it is to be a continual source of infilling throughout one's life. Wow. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, 20-something people raised from the dead, documented. Guess he knows a little something, right? <laughs> he said, it is a luxury to be filled with the Spirit, but it is also a divine command. He said, not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. He said, no Pentecostal person, of course, we don't have to be Pentecostal to do this, in denomination. But he said, no Pentecostal person ought to get out of bed in the morning without first getting lost in the Spirit, speaking to themselves in other tongues. He said, I maintain the opinion that if one would be continually filled with the Spirit, he will speak in the Spirit morning, noon, and night. Now, here's one more for the road, because I know I don't want to lose you, you know, let you go to sleep. My voice is soothing. I don't want you to go to sleep. But anyway, so <laughs> John G. Lake again. <laughs> John G. Lake, he said, hey, I, and remember now he's an apostle to the continent of Africa. Tremendous signs, wonders, and miracles. He said, I want to speak to you with the utmost frankness concerning this particular language of tongues, which I speak, he said, uh, most often in the nighttime. For I found it to be not only the source of power that I operate in on a daily basis, but also an invaluable source of revelation knowledge that I preach to people every day. So obviously, this, this praying in the Spirit, friends, it elevates our spiritual consciousness and perception in every realm. Not just to the leadings of the Spirit, but the enlightenment of the Scripture. He said, man, I found it to be a source of power. I found it to be a source of revelation that I preach to people every day. Is his assertion true? Is it a source of power and revelation? I think the scripture bears it out. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. Only got two more scriptures. Whoa. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, what's he doing? Edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. So I'm not going to come out here for an hour and just colomo se belera di era di acoro da bascentere e miso se per. I'm not going to just come out speaking in tongues. You're not going to be edified, but I will. But he said, he who speaks in an unknown tongue does what? Edifies himself. There's something occurring when we're speaking in the Spirit. I like the Knox translation. He who speaks in an unknown tongue strengthens his own faith. Here's another one, the Beck translation. He who speaks in an unknown tongue encourages himself. Here's my favorite, the Webster. He who speaks in an unknown tongue receives an uplifting and strengthening influence. Who's that influence? The Holy Ghost. Amen. And this is for everybody, young to old. Everybody that's been enlisted into the kingdom, this is your time. God's counting on us. Are you with me? Now, one more vood. Uh, vood. <laughs> Jude, verse 20. Vood. No, Jude, verse 20. Jude. <laughs> I crack myself up sometimes. <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. Jude, the brother of James, in his epistles writes, uh, But you, beloved, doing what? Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, the New English Bible says, watch this, fortify yourselves. Strengthen yourselves. But now here's the key word, 
Sustain yourself. What? Sustain yourself. Your position. Sustain your sensitivity. How? Praying in the power of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> so listen. Lest you and I, as this season, this final season is closing out. Now listen, don't let yourself get callous when somebody says Jesus is coming. Oh, they've been saying that for eons. Let me tell you, Peter said in the last days that men will scoff. Oh, where's the promise of his coming? Everything continues as it was. But one day, suddenly, boom, it's going to happen. And uh, I'm going to be ready. But not just ready, active. Everybody say active. <laughs> Amen. Oh, it's going to be awesome. So, let's walk in the Spirit. Let's be led by the Spirit. By staying filled with the Spirit. And let's be impacting people's lives for the kingdom of God in a powerful way. Let's make sure our measures are operating at full capacity. Anybody with me? And listen, don't look at yourself too intently. And what I mean by that is, people say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm not worthy. God can't use me. I've got so much junk in my life. Let me tell you, if he can use a donkey, as they say, he can use anybody. Don't rule yourself out because of your imperfections. It is not our imperfections that keep God from using us. Sometimes it's just our willingness. Are you with me? None of us are perfect, guys. Come on. That's why we've got the blood of Jesus. Well, hallelujah. And man, I rely on that. Amen. Come on, everybody. Let's stand up tonight. Uh, before we leave.